tackle two chapters, Infancy and Childhood, chapters four and five. We're going to grow this kid up a little bit, and I'm going to show you pictures of my daughter and my grandson right off the bat. Here we go. <laughs> okay, we're talking about infancy. Um, children grow faster during the first three years, especially during the first few months, than they ever will again. Uh, this rapid growth rate tapers during the second and third years. Uh, by five months, the average baby uh, boy has doubled his birth weight, and he will triple it by uh, year one. Uh, by his second uh, birthday, a, a boy will only add five more pounds to his weight. And this is my grandson at age two. This is my daughter. This is my daughter with, with him as a newborn. <clears throat> And that's me with him. The first time he ever saw snow, that was in Denver, Colorado. <laughs> My daughter went up there for a volleyball tournament. And uh, that was the first time he ever saw snow. Now he comes up to my shoulder, so, and he's 10 years old. A boy's height will typically increase by 10 inches to the, in the first year to about 30 inches. They will gain 5 inches in height the second year to about 3 feet tall. A uh, baby begins teething at three to four months, but they typically don't emerge until the fifth or ninth month. At one, they will have from six to eight teeth. By two and a half, they will have a mouthful of 20. And there he is at 18 months, carrying his uncle's Coke can. I think I've shown you that picture before. In the womb and after they are born, children develop from head to tail, which is, uh, and that, that word is cephalocaudally, and from inside out, or proximodistally. Uh, the head and the brain are the largest thing about a developing fetus uh, and a newborn. At two months gestation, it takes up one half the body length. At birth, it takes up one quarter of the body length. As adults, our heads are about one eighth of our body length. And that is a, an example. Uh, these are, those are bows, not Martian ears. <laughs> anyway, there we go. Here we are as a newborn, a little girl, and here she is at 25. And as you can see, about one eighth of her body uh, length is her head. And here's a little boy, same thing, newborn. And here he is at 25, one eighth of his body length. There you go. Genes interact with the environment. Uh, for example, nutrition and living conditions impact general health and well-being. Uh, well-fed, well-cared for, ch for children grow taller and heavier than less well-nourished and nurtured children. Better medical care, immunization, and antibiotics have led to better health. One thing's th thing we noticed um, into the 1960s and 1970s, uh, the kids that played that were from the city uh, didn't get as good of food as the kids from the country. So the country kids, a lot of times they would come into the to the big city and they would be bigger and stronger uh, than the uh, city kids. But of course, all that has changed the the food. Uh, most people are getting a fairly good food now. It's not just the country kids that are getting all the meat that they want. <clears throat> Bottle feeding babies did not uh, become possible until the 17th century in Europe. Before that time, if a mother didn't want to breastfeed her own baby, can inconvenience, sagging breasts, she would find another woman and have her breastfeed for her. This woman was known as a wet nurse. In the 19th century, an increase in infant deaths was blamed on wet nurses and, and uh, bottle feeding. Uh, in, the 20th, uh, in the 1920s, bottle feeding once again became popular and didn't go out of vogue until the 1970s with the Le Leche movement, uh, which is Spanish for the milk. Breast milk was almost always the best food for newborns and is recommended for at least the first 12 months. Parents can avoid obesity and cardiac problems in themselves and in their children by adopting the more active lifestyle for the entire family and to breastfeed their babies. Breastfed babies have fewer gastrointestinal infections. Uh, recent research has refuted previous research that breastfeeding reduced the risk of allergies. Breastfeeding for three months reduces the amount of wheezing in babies. Uh, there is no proof that breastfeeding reduces asthma later in life. Uh, breastfeeding, uh, our breastfed babies are less likely to develop otitis media, and this is mainly because 
what uh, mothers will do is she'll put her baby uh, down uh, with uh, with a bottle to put him to put them to sleep, and the milk will drip into their ear, and that's what causes the uh, otitis media. That's an ear infection, and that's where it happens right there. That's the pus right there. Uh, atopic dermatitis is chronic inflammation of the skin. Breastfed babies are less likely to develop atopic dermatitis for the same reason they put the baby down with, uh, with uh, a bottle and the, the milk gets onto their face and it uh, uh, causes the uh, atopic dermatitis. Breastfed feeding protects an individual from becoming obese throughout the individual's life. Breastfed babies are less likely to develop type one diabetes, breastfed babies are less likely to develop type 2 diabetes as adults. Breastfed infants are less likely to die from SIDS. Women who breastfeed are less likely to develop breast cancer. Women who breastfeed are less likely to develop ovarian cancer. Women who breastfeed are less likely to develop type 2 diabetes than women who don't breast than women who don't breastfeed. Women shouldn't breastfeed when they have an active infection that may be transmitted in the breast milk, and this, of course, includes HIV. A woman should not breastfeed if she has an active case of tuberculosis. Uh, this is caused by the bacteria, Mycobacterium tuberculi, and that's what it looks like on an x-ray. These clouds, those are infected uh, areas in, their, in her lungs. A woman who is taking a drug that may be transferred to the infant in her breast milk should not breastfeed, and this woman is, is chasing the dragon. That's opium that she is, is sucking into that straw. Taking hormonal birth control pills does not get into the woman's breast milk and therefore does not affect the baby. Uh, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors are expressed in the woman's breast milk and can cause lethargy poor feeding, and fever in an infant that is exposed. Uh, the SSRI's uh, Prozac seems to have the most negative effects, and Zoloft has the least. And for that reason, uh, a woman who is, uh, has just had a child and is suffering from, is suffering from postpartum depression, uh, usually they'll give her Zoloft. They should give her Zoloft, and certainly not Prozac. Breastfeeding women who find themselves needing pain control can use the following medications uh, safely. Acetaminophen, which is uh, Tylenol, uh, ibuprofen, uh, oral codeine, uh, hydro, uh, hydroxycodone, uh, morphine, and other methods of delivering codeine are contraindicated. Not a good idea. The following drugs will cross into the breast milk of the mother and, and cause varying degrees of problems with breastfeeding infants. Marijuana, cocaine, heroin, phenocyclidine, also known as PCP, and amphetamines. Not a good idea. Alcohol readily passes into the breast milk. Infants who ingest milk contaminated with alcohol will drink less milk and maintain a disrupted sleep pattern where they sleep for reduced amounts of time. Heavy drinking by a breastfeeding woman may cause a drunken effect from her infant. Loss of pain sensitivity, deep sleep, inability to suck, and deep respiration. Not a good idea. Women who smoke will have nicotine in their breast milk. In the past, it has been reported that nicotine in breast milk caused infants to have more respiratory ailments. However, new studies show that while it isn't suggested that women smoke if they are breastfeeding, there is no proof that there are any negative consequences. Nicotine levels peak at 30 to 60 minutes and take three hours to clear from the, the body, from the milk. The world has changed considerably since your grandparents or even your parents were children. The leading cause of death until the 1970s was still some childhood illnesses. Now diseases that used to devastate whole areas of the globe have been all but eradicated. Polio, measles, whooping cough, even chickenpox are no longer the scourge of youth. And I had all of these. I didn't have whooping cough, and I didn't have polio, certainly. Uh, but I did have chickenpox. I did have measles. One reason some parents hesitate to immunize their children is fear that vaccines, especially pertussis vaccine, may cause brain damage. Failure to receive vaccinations appear to be more deadly. 18% of the deaths in the developing world are due to preventable diseases. 
Vaccination has been so successful that smallpox has been eradicated worldwide. And I was counting my scars uh, this morning, and I counted four. I've got four smallpox vaccination scars, one from when I was five in 1955. Yeah, 1955. Uh, one when I started college. One when I joined the military in 1971. And one when I uh, went overseas, they gave me a smallpox. I was heading into an area that had uh, uh, had smallpox in the area. Now we've eradicated it. My daughter uh, was born in 1969, and she received a smallpox vaccination. But my son, who was born in 1972, did not. So it was at that point that they decided that it was unnecessary. Uh, we had eradicated it from the United States. And uh, here are the immunization uh, schedules uh, at two months. Diphtheria, pertussis, tetanus, polio, influenza, and pneumococcal. At uh, four months, uh, diphtheria, pertussis, tetanus, polio, influenza, pneumococcal, and hepatitis B. At six months, diphtheria, pertussis, tetanus, influenza, and pneumococcal. At one year, uh, influenza and pneumococcal. At 15 months, measles, mumps, rubella, influenza, and varicella. Varicella zoster causes herpes. It also causes chickenpox. Uh, 18 months, it's not going to keep you from getting herpes. It's going to keep you from getting chickenpox. 18 months, uh, hepatitis B, polio, diphtheria, pertussis, and tetanus. At four to six years, diphtheria, pertussis, tetanus, polio, measles, mumps, and rubella. Uh, 11 to 12 years, measles, mumps, and rubella. Uh, 14 to 16 years, diphtheria and tetanus. At birth, the brain weighs about 25% of its eventual adult weight of three and a half pounds. By age three, the brain will be 90% of its total size. By age six, it is almost at its adult size. But that doesn't mean that, that uh, children are thinking like adults, or can think like adults. The brain's maturation takes much longer than was previously thought. Brain growth spurts coincide with changes in cognitive behavior, the learning of language, environmental stimulation. Uh, you need environmental stimulation in order to, uh, to uh, uh, change the brain. Uh, for the brain to uh, mature. Specialization of the hemispheres is called lateralization. Uh, the left side of your brain, you can touch it right now, is for language. The right side is visual spatial. The brain represents 70% of the weight of the nervous system. The occipital lobe is, the vis is where visual up, uh, information takes place. That's right here, right behind the eyes, as you can see, the occipital lobe. The temporal lobe is on the sides and right, right kind of behind your head. That's uh, where hearing and language takes place. Uh, parietal lobe is where touch and spatial information take place. Uh, the, the parietal lobe is right here. This is where your movement takes place. And frontal lobe is higher level thinking, such as speech and reason. And that's right here. And that's one of the reasons why when you get hit in the head and we think that you might have a concussion, one of the things that we do is, is that we check all four of those. We want to check to see if you can move properly. We want to uh, check to see if you can hear properly uh, and uh, interpret what we're saying. Uh, we want to make sure that you can see properly and you, your, your eyesight is not off. That's one of the reasons why we ask you how many fingers we're holding up. Uh, and we also will ask you a, a question that is uh, that you'll have to think about, one that you're probably not thinking about right now, uh, like uh, who's the president of the United States? What day is it? You know, that's something that you're that is not readily available, and you'll have to go into your brain to find it. Smiling, babbling, crawling, walking, and talking are possible due to rapid development of the brain, particularly the cerebral cortex. Cerebral cortex is the outer covering of your brain. Uh, plasticity is modifiability of the brain, and the human brain is very is highly modifiable, and that's one of the reasons why we send kids to school and why kids, uh, every year, uh, the, uh, the material gets more and more complex. Throughout early life, the brain is creating more and more complex neuronal pathways, and this is, of course, before school or school even starts. 
Even before birth, the brain is integrating neuronal coordination of muscle groups, a process known as integration. At the same time, select neurons are being developed to have a specialized structure and function, a process known as differentiation. When neuronal cell functions are no longer needed or no longer used, cell death occurs and the body prunes the excess brain cells. You don't need them anymore, let's get rid of them. Because if we don't get rid of them, they're just going to clog things up. Just, and that's what Alzheimer's disease is all about, things getting clogged up. So we need to get rid of as much uh, unnecessary material as possible. Early experience can uh, have lasting effects on emotional development and the capacity of the central nervous system to learn and store information. Sometimes corrective experience can make up for past deprivation. Uh, so if there was a problem, if uh, the parents didn't talk to the child, uh, then uh, later on, if uh, with a lot of stimulation, uh, that they can make up for that. Myelin is a fatty insulating substance that uh, begins about halfway through the gestation in some parts of the brain and continues into adulthood in others. This accounts for improving abilities at various times during adulthood. Milestones of motor development, babies first learn simple skills and then combine them into increasingly complex systems of action. Humans begin to walk later than other species, possibly because babies' heavy heads and short legs make balance difficult. One test that has been developed to chart motor development is the Denver Developmental Screening Test that charts a child's progress and compares it to other children of similar age and gender. According to Thalen, normal babies develop the same skills in the same order because they are built approximately the same way and have similar physical challenges and needs. That's one of the reasons why if you go into a, uh, a kindergarten class, all the kids are right about at the same level. No matter who they are, no matter where they're from, no matter what uh, uh, ethnic or racial group they may hap happen to come from. Not until babies can get around by themselves do they learn from experience or from a caregiver's warnings that a steep drop-off drop can be dangerous. And this is, of course, a plexiglass, and the baby is trying to, to crawl out there. But uh, in time, of course, they recognize the fact, fact that there is a drop-off. This, this is a kid, a, a baby goat, and they see it right away. If there are chances to explore their surroundings, motor development is more likely to be normal. Some cultures actively encourage early development of motor skills. Giselle uh, concluded that children perform certain activities when they are ready, and training gives no advantage. Findings do not indicate whether changes in the brain or in muscle strength, or both, are involved in motor development but they do suggest the interaction of biology and environment. And this is my grandson again. There, there he is playing golf. He just drilled one, and he, he's real surprised. And here he is playing soccer. Right now he's on an elite team, and he just made the uh, traveling team. So uh, this is him when he first started. He really wanted to play soccer a lot. He's, he's, a, he's a, a strawberry freak. The kid wants strawberries all the time, which is not bad. They're kind of expensive right now, but hey, at least we got him eating something other than what does he like. He likes those hot Cheetos. <sighs> touch and pain. Touch seems to be the first sense to develop. Pain experienced during the neonatal period may sensitize an infant to later pain, perhaps by affecting the neural pathway uh, that process uh, painful, that processes painful stimuli. Uh, preference of pleasant odors seems to be learned in utero during the first few days after birth. Preference for the fragrance of the mother's breast may be a survival mechanism. Uh, newborn's rejection of bitter taste is probably another survival mechanism since many bitter substances are toxic and not the lemon, of course. I drink lemonade all the time. Hearing is, a, is functional before birth. Auditory discrimination develops rapidly after birth. Hearing is a, a key to language development, so hearing impairments should be identified as early as possible. 
Vision is the least developed sense at birth, and this is my grandson uh, at, a, a, at about two years of age, or two days of age. <laughs> Vision becomes more acute uh, during the first year, uh, reaching the 2020 level by about the sixth month. Binocular vision is where the individual uses both eyes to focus. This leads to the perception of depth and distance developing at four or five months. In recent decades, survival rates have improved in all regions of the world, but in the United States there continues to be a disparity between different racial and ethnic groups. African Americans, American Indians, and Hawaiian babies have twice the infant mortality as other groups in the United States. <clears throat> Birth defects, congenital abnormalities, uh, were the leading cause of infant deaths in the United States in 1998. That was a long time ago. Infant mortality or, uh, for white Americans is around 6 per 1,000, while it is over twice as high among African Americans. Disparities in health care are considered the reason for the difference uh, and the larger number of teenage women giving birth to low birth weight babies. And as you can see, the there's the... Uh, White non-Hispanic, there's Hispanic and uh, Asian Pacific Islander. American Indians at 9.22. <clears throat> black non-Hispanic. Now you may ask yourself, why is there such a disparity between American Indians and black non-Hispanic? And the reason is because <clears throat> uh, most American Indians uh, have treaties that uh, allow them to have health care. Uh, whereas uh, black uh, non-Hispanic individuals do not. And so there is a lot of poverty in the, in the African-American community, and there is no, uh, not adequate health care as there is uh, in most. And you, you can complain about IHS all you want, but uh, at least there is some kind of health care out there. Um, and I'm not going to get into an argument about how bad it is, because it's the same. You get the same. Uh, IHS is about the same as military health care. Same doctors. SIDS, uh, low birth weight babies are five to ten, ti ten times more likely to die from SIDS as normal birth weight babies. Uh, when an infant dies in a family from SIDS, later born children in that family have a two to four times greater probability of dying from SIDS. Infants who hold their breath for 10 seconds or longer have sleep apnea. 6% of infants with sleep apnea die from SIDS. African American and Alaskan Native children, Tlingit and Aleut, are four times, four to six times more uh, likely to die from SIDS. SIDS occurs more frequently in infants from lower socioeconomic circumstances. When there is smoke in a baby's house, they are more likely to die from SIDS. SIDS who are uh, infants who are put to bed with a pacifier are less likely to die of SIDS. When a baby is put in, in, uh, to bed with a fan in the room, they are 70% less likely to die of SIDS. After the neonatal period, death due to in injuries are the third leading cause of death after SIDS and birth defects. Just under one quarter of the injuries are intentional. In other words, the baby is murdered. It's homicide. The leading cause of death by injury is homicide. Other leading causes of death include suffocation, motor vehicle accidents, or choking on food or other objects. According to Piaget, a baby is born with all its senses primed to take in new information. The baby organizes all the incoming data in a form of schemes that are added to and changed with new information. Right after birth, the newborn must operate in its world using its senses and motor skills. This stage Piaget referred to as the sensory motor stage. The newborn will try to understand the world using its senses, especially its mouth. The stage runs from birth to two years. The infant's first interactions with the world are through reflexive behavior. Hunger plus presence of nipple equals the rooting reflex. After about one month, the infant will begin developing habits and circular, circular reactions. A habit is a scheme based on a reflex that becomes separated from its stimuli. Sucking when a nipple isn't present, a circular reaction is a repetitive action. And you'll see the baby dreaming about, about uh, sucking. 
An infant will begin participating in primary circular reaction. The infant will use its body in a repetitive manner. And this is my grandson at age two months. You can see that my daughter had him already primed to be an athlete. Whether it actually happens, I don't know. He's just 10 years old. At between four to eight months, the child will begin participating in secondary circular reactions. The infant will go outside itself for stimulation. Between the 8th and the 12th month, the infant will begin coordinating its secondary circular reactions. The infant will begin mixing and matching its ex exploration of its environment. And this is my grandson. Uh, at, uh, at 8 months, I think, he's standing and he's got, he's got his, his drink. That's, he lived in Florida at the time. It was hot down there. Tertiary circular reactions develop between the 12th and 18th month. The infant starts exploring the properties of its environment. Internalization of schemes occurs between the 18th and 24th month. The child begins using symbols such as language to, to communicate. And here, this child that can't speak is, is talking on the phone. Between the 4th and 8th month, the baby will develop an understanding that just because someone or something is not there, it isn't gone. This is known as object permanence. At about 18 months, most toddlers will begin to talk and gesture. Words and gestures are uh, examples of the first stage of abstract thinking, the use of symbols. Children begin to engage in pretend play and waving becomes the sign language of goodbye. Language is made up of individual sounds that are put together to make words that have meaning. These sounds are called phonemes. There are about 44 in the English language, depending on where you live. And I'm going to, I have a video that will show you all the, I think, all of the phonemes. There we go. Who's ready to hatch some cool pets? Click here to make your very... The key sounds of English. 44 phonemes and 4 blends. 18 consonant phonemes. B K D F G H J O M mm. mm. Five consonant digraph phonemes. And sixteen vowel phonemes. Five R controlled phonemes. Er, R, or, air, ear. Four blends. Your, you, x, or, x. And here they are. Oh, there we go. Okay. All of them. Hit them all. Good job. Okay. There we go. When we put phonemes together, if the sounds we put together communicate, they are words or morphemes. A morpheme is the smallest unit of meaning. Carport has two morphemes. Uh, car and port. Roper has two morphemes, rope and er, meaning somebody who does something.
Sequence of early language development as physical structures mature. Children are able to make more and more sounds. Neuronal connections necessary to associate sound and meaning become activated. Social interaction with adults introduces babies to communicative nature of speech. The sequence of languages, pre-linguistic speech, cooing and babbling, uh, linguistic speech, hollow phrasing, uh, telegraphic speech. Hollow phrases is where you use one word to mean something. Telegraphic speech is where you leave out all the, the, uh, the uh, connecting words. Children learn language quite rapidly, a process referred to as fast mapping. One reason is because the parent tends to try to teach their child words by labeling objects when they are both looking at the item. This is known as joint attention. Chomsky suggested an inborn language acquisition device, or an LAD, programs, which programs children's brains to analyze the language they hear and to figure out its rules, and this is known as nativism. Evidence that environmental influences alone cannot explain the emergence of lingu linguistic expression. So, so Chomsky makes a lot of sense, and there are a lot of people that adhere to the idea that we learn languages because it is a, it, we need it to communicate. We need it to survive. The left hemisphere seems to be a critical portion of the brain for learning language. No other primate can learn language. Language acquisition must take place before the age of 12, or it only takes place with much effort and incompletely. First attempts to communicate at 10 months. After the first birthday, the child will engage in conversation with adults. As the child ages, the language skills improves and the vocabulary grows. Children simplify language. Children overregularize uh, rules. They apply them rigidly, not knowing that some rules have, ex have exceptions. Children understand grammatical relationships they cannot yet express. Children under underextend word meanings. Children simplify language, all dry, hit ball. They apply them rigidly, not knowing that some rules have exceptions. I played with toy, I go to store. Uh, children understand grammatical relationships they cannot yet express. I like you. When the world is mine, your death shall be quick and painless. Well, that's a little stewy, I guess. Uh, Tanya, uh, they understand, they uh, underextend uh, word meanings. Tanya won't let anyone else call their f father daddy because that is what she calls her father. Therefore, she's the only one that gets to call him daddy or get to call somebody daddy. Uh, they overextend word meanings. Melissa calls all animals doggy because that is what her mother taught her to call their dog. Reading aloud to your child allows for opportunities for emotional intimacy and parent-child communication. Children who, who are read too often have better language skills at ages 2, 4, and 5, and better reading comprehension at age 7. According to Erickson, uh, in his 1950 book, early experiences are the key to developing either trust or mistrust. Sensitive, responsive, consistent caregiving leads to trust. Mistrust is developed when the infant's basic needs are not met. Autonomy versus shame and doubt leads to a shift from external to self-control. Neg negativism is the, the tendency to shout no just for the sake of resisting authority. This type of behavior hits its peak during the terrible twos. Negativism may hit another peak between three and a half and four, but will usually decline before entering school. Birth to six to eight weeks, uh, evolution has endowed a baby with many behaviors that elicit caregiving from the, the adult. Crying, smiling, gazing intently into the parent's faces. Uh, the parent responds by holding and cuddling the baby. This creates an interactive system and is the first step in attachment. Six to eight weeks to six to eight months, the next stage is attachment in the making stage. Babies start to recognize and act differently around familiar and unfamiliar caregivers. They attach themselves to primary caregivers and cling to them when they are in distress or mock distress. Six to eight months to 18 months. By the seventh or eighth month, the child has usually singled out one of their caregivers as their favorite. Usually it's their mother. The child will use the mother as a base to explore from. 
the baby trusts the mother to be there. Now, it doesn't have to be the mother. It can be anybody. It can, uh, it can be a grandparent. Uh, it can be the father. It can be, you know, anybody. It can be the neighbor, <laughs> if the neighbor's around enough, I guess. Uh, but it can be anybody. 18 months and older, the uh, ever-expanding cognitive and language skills of the child call for more and more interaction between the child and the parent. The child will and should take the initiative to initiate these interactions. Negotiation often takes place. There is a strong relationship between the father's close involvement with his baby and the baby's development. The father's involvement in caregiving has increased by one-third in a single generation. One-fourth of U.S. fathers take care of their preschool-aged children while the mother works, and nearly one-fifth are primary caregivers. U.S. fathers tend to play with their children in a more physical style, though this is not common in other countries. Developing attachments, a reciprocal enduring emotional tie, a secure attachment is where the baby greets mom happily when she returns. Avoided attachment. Wait a second. Do I now? Okay. Let me explain this all to you. Okay. This is from an experiment done by Bowlby uh, and Ainsworth, and the uh, it was Ain actually it was Ainsworth's re research. What she did, she had uh, mother mothers bringing in their children, and uh, what uh, they left them in the room. They they observed them the whole time they were in there. So they brought them into a room, and there were toys to play with. And then the mother left, and they watched the child as the mother left. And then they watched the child and, and, and how she, uh, the, uh, the child greeted the mother when, when they came back. And from this, they came up with these different forms of attachment. So that was the, the experiment. So the secure attachment was when the baby greeted the mo mom happily, when she returned. The avoidant attachment was the, they avoid the mom when she does return. They didn't pay any attention to her. Ambivalent or resistant attachment, anxious even before the mother leaves, ambivalent when she returns. Uh, so the baby was acting like something might happen, and when it did happen, the baby either was greeted the mother or avoided the mother. Disorganized, dis disoriented attachment was inconsistent and with contradictory behavior. Mothers tended to be insensitive, intrusive, or abusive with the disorganized and disoriented, so the baby didn't know how to react because there was no scheme. The mother you know, was insensitive or intrusive or, or abusive. Erickson and other theorists feel that the infant-parent relationship lays the foundation for all later social relationships. Therefore, a child who experiences a secure relationship with their parents will be able to maintain their pattern of attachment throughout their lives. Insecure attachments may lead to other problems for the child due to problems in the parent-child relationship. Maltreatment, parental mental illness uh, are some of the things that can cause problems with attachment. Uh, and one of those parental mental illnesses is uh, postpartum depression. Uh, and it can be a, a real barrier for the uh, mother and the child to bond. Researchers have determined that secure attachment is most likely to occur when parents are responsive and sensitive. Babies who have difficult temperaments are less likely to develop secure attachment. Unfortunately, these difficult children do not elicit positive treatment from their parents. Research shows that these mothers can be trained to give their children the type of treatment that they need. Newborns are able to demonstrate their unhappiness by crying, flailing their arms, and stiffening their bodies. When babies need something, they cry. When they are feeling sociable, they smile or laugh. When their emotions are responded to, they react in a similar manner when the emotion occurs again. Smiling occurs spontaneously soon after birth, but is usually not tied to anything specific. Spontaneous smiling slowly decreases over the first three months. Responsive smiling begins the second week to stimulation, usually feeding. By the third week, the infant smiles in response to voices and faces. Social smiling begins at uh, one month. Laughing begins in the fourth month to stimulation. Researchers have discovered that babies can show joy, sadness, interest, and fear at birth. 
Later, they show anger, surprise, and disgust, depending on the amount of emotional stimulation and the emotional display their caregivers have shown them. Body movement is also a good way of reading a baby's emotion. If they turn the body away or they turn their gaze away, that means they don't want to interact. Babies rarely react negatively to strangers before six months of age. Many children react more negatively to strangers around their eighth or ninth month, though it gradually decreases uh, to their first year. Babies are less likely to act negatively if mothers speak positively of the individual and they approach the baby slowly and playfully. Uh, I was working with a lady and she had a baby, she had a newborn, and when she brought the baby in, she thought it was funny that the baby didn't want to be held by anybody. She laughed and laughed and laughed. And it was really kind of weird because when the baby got close to, to a, a man, she would uh, gasp and the baby would start crying. So the baby didn't respond to males at all. And she just thought that was the funniest thing in the world. I don't have any idea how everything turned out. <laughs> she, uh, she left... Uh, when the baby was about six or seven months old. While most children worldwide express the same basic and complex emotions in some cultures, emotional expression is encouraged, and in others, it isn't. Research comparing American children with Chinese children showed that at 11 months, American children cried and smiled more than 11-month-old Chinese children. Collectivist uh, ideals and individualistic ideals. When American children are given awards uh, where they stand out, they feel proud in their personal achievement. In China, the same situation would elicit embarrassment and shame. This situation would be celebrated by honoring the entire class or even the entire school. If someone takes something from an American child, they are likely to show anger. In Buddhist countries, a child rarely shows anger for any reason at all. One of the basic means of surviving in a social world is to take cues of, for our behavior from others. Children begin doing this at birth and we will we all continue it uh, when we are in an unfamiliar or ambiguous situation. This is known as social referencing. We'll look around and we'll figure out well, how are we supposed to act. When I first arrived at Celie I had uh, only dealt with uh, uh, Diné people a, a little bit, not, not a whole lot. I had a really good friend who was who was a, a Navajo up in uh, Montana, uh, and we were pretty good friends, but uh, he <laughs> it was only one guy. <laughs> and there were other uh, Navajos around, but I mean, they were just, uh, I, I, they were never in, uh, in, in a group, and I had no idea how people, how uh, Navajo people reacted. So when I first uh, came into a uh, situation, uh, I assumed it would be very similar to what was going on in uh, on the reservation in uh, Montana, but I was wrong. Uh, it was not. So uh, I took my cues from watching everybody else and how they interacted. Uh, okay, social referencing may be one of the reasons why children often mimic their parents' phobias. As children get older, they begin regulating their own emotion. Uh, a child is more likely... Yeah, my friend in, uh, 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 up in Montana who was uh, Dene was uh, named Dave Begay. Uh, and now, of course, <laughs> I haven't been able to find... He came back down here after his wife died up in Montana. But uh, I haven't been able to find him. And uh, another individual that I uh, uh, had a, had a uh, uh, social relationship with was a, a Dr. Yazi, uh, Dr. Victoria Yazi. And I haven't been able to find her either. It's a pretty big reservation. I think she's in Tuba City. And I don't know where Dave is. He never told me where he lived. And uh, of course, he was living up there. It was really kind of a strange situation. Anyway, okay, so let's go ahead and get start go talk about this stuff. As children get older, they begin uh, regulating their own emotion. A child is more likely to try to deal with their own fear as they get older than seek assistance. Children will use mental strategies to manage emotions, talking to themselves in order to control unwanted feelings. Not all children are able to regulate their emotions. And the ones who struggle tend to have problems interacting with others. Through the first year, children have been playing with their own toys. They will allow older children, uh, older people to play with them, 
but they don't really play well with their peers. About age one, the child begins to be able to play alongside a peer who is playing with a similar toy or in a similar manner. The child will monitor each other's play, but they won't play with each other. This is known as parallel play, and that's what's going on here. These two individuals, whoops, let's go back. Oh, let me get my arrow. There we go. Okay, these two indi individuals have Etch-a-Sketches, and they're playing, but they're not playing together. As the children approach their second birthday, they will begin playing together in a more organized fashion. In this play, they will accept specialized roles, and the play will, will follow specific themes. This type of play is referred to as cooperative play. Between the 15th and 18th month mark, the, child, the children will begin uh, engaging in similar activities and talk and smile with one another while this takes place. This is shown as simple social play. As children become older, their cooperative play becomes more and more intricate. Children will start using more Im imaginary themes in, it, in their play and will incorporate items that may take on some quite imaginary characteristics. And this is known as, referred to as symbolic play. And here's the nurse, and there's the mommy, and there's the little girl. And she's cutting a tomato, I think. Anyway, she's checking to make sure she's still breathing, I guess. Researchers have discovered that symbolic play follows cultural precepts. American children tend to engage in more adventure and fantasy play, while Korean children play following more traditional values, family themes with harmony more important than conflict. And that is the end of chapters 4 and 5. So I'll talk to you next week.